Hello everyone, I am Tynan Sylvester, and this is RimWorld Beta 19. We are now past daily version 2000, so it's been a long ride to get here. And I had hoped to get uh, 1.0 out by now, but it turns out that the 90-90 principle, which says that the first 90% of the work takes 90% of the time, and then the last 10% takes another 90% of the time, is quite true. So, getting everything really right is uh, a lot harder than just getting it working pretty well. So, it's taken a decent amount of time to get us here. This is beta 19. Uh, in terms of the actual design changes, there are bridges in the game now. You can build things on them, but not the heaviest buildings. So, no crematoriums or anything like that. But you can make a water colony on a bridge sticking out into the ocean or over a wide river if you want. So. You know, let your, uh, the Hobbit fantasies run free and enjoy it as it is. However, there are downsides to the bridges. You can't put other floors on them. They will burn and collapse and destroy anything built on top of them. And if there's an explosion, it'll destroy the floor instantly as well. So I'm hoping there'll be some interesting trade-offs there. Next, we added a messages section to the history tab. So now when you accidentally click away a message or you want to go and see something that happened before, you're not completely screwed. You can, in fact, go back and look at the messages. It records the last 200 messages right now. We added plate armor. So this is basically medieval-ish body covering armor. It's quite expensive to make, but it's not particularly high tech, and it slows people down when they wear it. So that's kind of an early game heavy armor that you can use before you have access to actual marine armor of the high tech variety. There is now a water mill generator which will add a bit more interest to the rivers in the game because now you can use them to generate power. You can't put the water mills too close together because they give power all the time without any inputs, which is really powerful in terms of game balance. So in order to try to balance that, I set it up so that if they're set too close together, the turbulence from one water mill will create interference with the others and reduce the power generation. So if you want to use a lot of water mill power, you really have to set the water mills some distance apart from each other along the river, which opens you up to attacks, and it's kind of hard to defend rivers in some cases, so. Next up is a bit more jazzy in terms of new content. There are new turrets. So the old um, improvised turret is now the mini turret. It can be reinstalled. It's a bit more powerful, a bit longer range uh, than it was before. But we've also added the autocannon turret and the uranium slug turret. So the autocannon is uh, two by two, non-reinstallable, very powerful, pretty good range as well, but it has a minimum range too. So whereas the mini turret was often used in a very packed in tight formation in sort of a closed structure, the autocannon turret and the uranium slug turret really excel in more open spaces with long fields of fire at long range. So uh, I'm hoping that there's gonna be combinations of turrets that work really well in certain situations and they consume different resources. Now, autocannons will punch through armor very effectively, but if you're getting raided by, you know, heavily armored enemies like uh, mechanoid centipedes, then you might want something a little bit, a little bit punchier, so to speak. And that's where the uranium slug turret comes in. It fires uranium, which it does consume. Uh, I'll talk about that more in a second. But the damage is absolutely massive. It will rip off pretty much any human limb on impact and it will penetrate huge amounts of armor. Now, there is a new scenario since people were asking for it and I think the game should have it for completeness. It's called Naked Brutality and it's really simple. So you start naked with absolutely nothing. So one character, no resources, go. This is a very difficult scenario in the early game and I really don't recommend it unless you are ready to suffer and die in some cases even if you don't make a mistake because there are things like food poisoning and infections that can get you by random luck, there is an element of luck when you have one person there. But the intensity of it and the high impact of every mistake and every outcome and every swing of every fist and claw kind of adds some excitement. So, you know, I've seen people having fun with it on the stream. The end of the game has also been punched up a little bit. Whereas before, you could build the ship and then just press a button and end the game. That was a little bit anticlimactic, so now the ship end sequence is different. Instead of just starting the ship and flying away, now you have to press a button on the reactor, 
which initiates a 15-day countdown. And during that countdown, your reactor is creating a signal that mechanoids and treasure hunters and desperate people can all sense from a long distance across the planet, which means you're going to get raided like hell during that time period. You're going to get raided pretty much every day, sometimes several times. Essentially, it's a gauntlet, a survival gauntlet that you have to prepare for and try to survive. Uh, you'll want to set up heavy defenses. You want to have a lot of single-use weapons ready. You want to have re resurrector uh, mech serums or healer mech serums. You want to have trained soldiers and good equipment. It's something to prepare for, and it's something that adds some intensity at the end of the game. So, uh, I've seen a lot of reports that really like this, so I'm really happy how that one played out because it's nice to have an actual conclusion that's not just pressing a button. Now, as I alluded to before, the turrets now take some degree of maintenance to keep up. So, whereas before they were really expensive to build, but then free to, to use, now they're cheaper to build and more effective. But there is an ongoing uh, minor cost to use them. So when they fire a lot, they will eventually uh, need some maintenance, which means your guy has to take some steel, or in the uranium turret's case, some, some uranium, to go and you know refurbish the barrel and make sure everything is tip-top shape. Uh, similar to that, the traps have also been reworked a little bit, whereas before they were expensive and weak, but could be used over and over and over again. Now they are cheaper, much cheaper, much more powerful, but they have to be replaced after they're used. And you can also move them around and reinstall them. So this makes them uh, a lot punchier and a lot more interesting to, to watch when they, they go off, because they really hit hard and you can pretty much count on them doing significant damage to anyone who walks over them. But w instead of the cost all being in the early game, uh, the cost is now spread out over the whole game. So they're a bit more effective in tactical scenarios. But in terms of building a hands-off, you know, away from keyboard meat grinder, uh, a bit less, less effective in that sense. Although you can still do it. I definitely like how those meat grinders work out, so I, I do want those strategies to work. But you're going to need some economics behind that to support that. Because that's a strategy. If you're using heavy, heavy turrets and traps, then you're essentially using economic uh, resources in order to avoid exposing people to danger. You can also do the reverse and expose your people to some danger in exchange for not having to spend those economic resources. So it's a trade-off be between economy and human danger. Now you can build patch leather, which means if you have a bunch of tiny little stacks of leather, you can combine them together. Patch leather is weaker than every type of leather, but you can still use it. So don't worry, that eight rat leather that you had sitting around will eventually be useful for something. Uh, you can smooth rocks, so you don't have to dig out the walls of your rooms underground and then build a wall inside the room. You can just smooth the, the wall just where it is. So it takes a lot of effort, with a lot of time to do it, but it produces a nice, beautiful wall and uh, doesn't consume any resources and most importantly is a little bit more interesting thematically and, and easier in terms of interface. Uh, when there is a infestation, the insects will no longer just pop into your base. Now they take time to tunnel in and you can see the tunnel coming. So you have a few seconds to get your guys out of the way. Of course, the insects are still pretty deadly and they're designed to be so, especially in those, inter uh, those interior situations. They're much weaker in open ground because they're so slow. Now the translations, we, we spent a bunch of time on getting the translation tools up to speed. Now there is a new tool, the translation cleaner. You press this button and it basically goes through all the translation files for whatever language you've selected and updates all the English references for each line, renames everything that's been renamed, removes things that are no longer useful or, or are obsolete and basically cleans out the files automatically. So this will save a ton of effort for translators. And I'm hoping to see more translations happening going forward. If you do speak one of the many languages that RimWorld supports besides English, and you're looking at maybe helping out with the translations, I do encourage you to go onto the forums at ludion.com forums and go into the translation section and take a look and see how you might contribute because all help is highly appreciated. Um, you can fabricate your own bionics now. It requires using a new building called the fabri Fabrication Bench. This is s a special new building that can be used to build advanced components and bionics and things like that. So uh, there's another tier of added body parts beyond bionics now called Arcotech. You cannot produce these. They're produced by 
hyper-intelligent machines, but uh, the bionics can now be produced, so you can build your army of super soldiers if you really want to invest the resources in that. So I say, you know, go for it, turn them into Terminator, see what happens. There's a number of new traits, you know, things like Undergrounder, uh, make someone not care about the darkness, and not care about being stuck underground. There's Tough, people take less damage, Quick Sleeper, you know, explore those when you play the game. Just a little bit of extra content we put in for fun. There's a new faction alliance system. So instead of factions just being hostile or neutral, now they can actually be your ally once you get them above 75 uh, goodwill with you. And allies will, unlike neutrals, they will send people to help you out randomly when you're being attacked. You can also give people gifts. Instead of just magically teleporting silver to other factions, you actually launch them gifts in transport pods or you know, carry it to their base and give it to them or give it to their traders. And they will sometimes give you gifts, especially if you're having trouble. They may take pity on you when they visit your base and leave you a few glitter world medicine or, uh, you know, a nice gun, something like that. One of the mechanoids has been split apart, whereas before the Scyther was a long distance sort of sniper type enemy. Now that is the Lancer and the new Scyther is a close range, you know, arm cutter offer type of guy. So that should make the name make a lot more sense. Instead of him doing everything, now you can try to defeat the Lancer by getting up close because he wants to snipe you from a range. And you can try to defeat the Scyther by shooting him from a distance or keeping him, keeping him far away. There's a bunch of new social interaction text and uh, general generated text. I spent a while writing these. I really enjoy writing these, <laughs> but um, yeah, I hope it'll add a little bit more flavor if you want to read some summaries of exactly what your people are saying to each other. And finally, the caravanning and transport pod systems are heavily improved across the board. Uh, the AI has changed. Um, you know, your animals will follow your guys around while they're loading. Other haulers will help load caravans. There's going to be a lot less problems with people going insane while they're tra supposed to be loading caravans or people going into transport pods and starving to death while they wait for other people to load the caravans. And also improvements to the actual caravanning interface have been made and it's been heavily rebalanced. So it's a lot clearer now how fast you can move over different types of terrain in different seasons and on roads. It's all s spelled out in the terrain tab on the, the world view. Uh, you have a little caravan dashboard that shows you things like your visibility, which is how much noise you're making. This is useful because if you're making a lot of noise with a big caravan with tons of animals, you'll get attacked more. But you can also send single person caravans to do special missions like going to engage in peace talks. The single person caravan is of course vulnerable, but he's less likely to come under attack. Just in general across the board, we, we improve this interface a lot. So quests have all been juiced up and the rewards are quite a bit more uh, interesting. You get the quests more often. The system was largely broken before, so uh, I'm hoping that it will see a lot more use now because it adds a lot of variety to just sitting around in your base and building stuff up. Although that is awesome too. So, that's it. As I said, there's a ton of other stuff, but I'm not going to cover everything here because we'd be here for literally hours. So, thank you for listening. I am Tynan Sylvester. This is RimWorld, and uh, go check out the game. And as always, I will see you guys next time. <laughs>